Hi again! Um, I thought today uh, I could talk to you about um, my placement that I've been on recently. So from uh, Christmas onwards until March I'm um, on placement in Brighton. So I'm at Brighton Hospital, um, the one on the seafront, and uh, I am in the head and neck um, ward there. So I'm working with a great team at the moment who um, are basically helping people who have had or have got cancer um, that's affecting their head or their neck. So this could mean anything here. So literally, I didn't even realise, but you can have cancer on your tongue, you can have cancer in your jaw, um, the cancer could be here, so it could affect their voice box and their ability to swallow. So it literally could be anywhere. So um, I want to tell you just a bit about um, what I've been doing, um, I've, well, or what I've been observing so far. My first day I went in um, and met my practice educator. There are people who um, are SLTs already in that field and are kind of our mentors whilst we're on placement. She definitely knows her stuff, that's why I say that. So um, I kind of just follow her around at the moment, which is nice and to be honest, I don't think I'd want to be getting my hands dirty quite yet. I feel like there's so much to learn and it's so different from working in a stroke ward which I was doing before Christmas. So with the stroke patients, a lot of the time when people have had strokes, um, they'll we'll see them a couple of days after their stroke. They'll be so tired. Um, obviously the strokes affected their brain a lot of the time. So sometimes their memory has um, been impaired. Sometimes um, their, it's, it's basically about their brain. So parts of their brain have been impaired and um, we're trying to help them get that back. So um, usually it's to do with their speech and um, helping them to understand or express language better. Um, whereas in head and neck cancer, obviously we don't deal with the brain, so a lot of, well all of the patients, don't have anything wrong with their brain at all. Their brain hasn't been affected. So they're aware, they're alert, they are usually very emotional because as you can imagine getting diagnosed with cancer um, it's going to be a really emotional time. Um, so it's a very different client base to work with basically and it's kind of taken me by surprise so I've had to really adapt the way I work um, which is a good thing so I'm definitely learning how to um, speak with these kind of clients. So yeah, so on my first day um, I arrived uh, at Brighton Hospital and my PE said we were going to go down and um, change uh, somebody's valve. So what's happened with this man is he had cancer in his throat here, so his voice box they do something called a laryngectomy. So ectomy means removal and larin is the larynx. So what they've done in surgery is they've made a flap of skin up here, they've taken out the larynx, so all of the voice box, so all of the things that we use to produce voice aren't there anymore. So they've taken that out and made it so that he has his trachea comes out here, so he's got a hole here called a stoma, and here is where he breathes from now. It's quite hard to explain, and until you see one, it's it's just a really a vague idea. So basically, he has a hole here, and that's going down his windpipe there. So that's the entrance to his windpipe now. He has something called a valve. So on the back wall, going into his esophagus, which is um, the food pipe, there's a little valve and it's tiny, literally like 
the size of a f no, it's not even the size of a five pence piece. It's smaller than that. Um, but what this does is it sits in the back wall in a little hole that's been surgically done and they insert the valve and it acts as vocal cords. So when we speak, the air comes up, vibrates our vocal folds, um, resonates in our mouth and then produces sounds from our articulations, so the different movements we make with our mouth. So what he has now is he has to cover up his trachea, so his hole. He takes in a deep breath and forces air up his trachea and through the valve and then this comes out of his mouth. So the air goes through the valve, vibrates like it would do with our vocal folds and comes out of his mouth where he articulates all of the sounds and he can produce a voice. So that's kind of like an artificial voice. And it's amazing, like I didn't realise there was something that could do that, which is really cool for those, for those people who don't have a voice anymore to get it back, it must be amazing. So we went to see um, a valve change, so every three months um, these people have to get their valves changed because they either become loose and then they're at risk of aspirating, so water or food might get into their lungs if there's a hole. Um, so we have to remove it, put another one in, but obviously when we remove it, if they were to drink anything, it would come through the hole and straight into the lungs through the trachea and we wouldn't want that because that's how people get chest infections. So um, it was quite a tricky manoeuvre. It was, I think it took about half an hour and it is quite a high pressure thing so obviously my PE was doing it, it wasn't me, I was just observing. There's about three people there trying to change the man's trachea. No, try trying to change the man's valve. Um, so they have to get in with forceps, hook onto the valve, pull it out, and then insert another one. And it all does get a bit tense because there's a lot of coughing, there's a lot of splurting of, um, of spit, basically. Uh, so yeah, it, <laughs> it got a bit tense and first thing on a Monday morning, I was a bit unsure of whether I would faint or not. My PE said to me, if you're going to faint, can you leave? Because um, it's not very professional. I was like, I, I don't know whether I'm going to faint. I've never fainted before, so how do you know if you're going to faint? So I just kind of stuck it out and it was actually really good to see. And I think for these people, it's kind of just like going to the dentist. Like, um, or like, I remember getting my braces tightened. Um, as a kid and it feels a bit like that so it's like a bit routine for them now and they're quite used to it happening so that was really interesting to see I think in the afternoon we went on a ward uh, so in Brighton Hospital they have lots of different wards but HCU is where um, the most emergent kind of cases go so um, like the highest care unit and um, so this is for people who have probably just had surgery um, and need like one-to-one -one attention from nurses quite often. So we went up to um, HCU and there was a lady who had had cancer of the tongue. So she had had what's called a glossectomy or a partial glossectomy, which means part of her tongue had been removed. So that part that had had the cancer was removed so that the cancer couldn't spread any further. She'd also had her um, lymph nodes removed, so she had a big scar around her neck here, and she'd also had a tonsillectomy. So I think the cancer had been on her tonsils too, so they removed the tonsils. The reason they removed the nodes is because the nodes is where, um, the nodes basically get rid of waste. So the lymph lymphatic system is like our waste removal. So if cancer gets into your nodes, so say there's lots in your neck, so it's the kind of thing that you feel when you're poorly, so your lymph nodes like swell up, um, those are the things I'm talking about here. Um, so if the cancer spreads to the nodes, they have a fast track system anywhere else in the body and you don't want that happening because once cancer's spread, 
obviously if it gets into your lungs, heart, um, stomach, it's obviously going to cause a lot more problems than if it's just in the head and neck. So you don't want it spreading. So she had uh, a, I can't remember what it's called, a nodectomy? Uh, as you can tell, I still don't know a lot. So obviously she was very tender, so we went and saw her um, and she was just basically um, worried about her speech. So as you can imagine, if half of your tongue's been removed, trying to um, swallow uh, by holding your t tongue between your teeth is really hard. So without that movement of your tongue, um, swallowing is going to be impaired and your speech is most likely going to be impaired. So what we're trying to do with her is we gave her some exercises to do, so to try and strengthen her tongue, like the, the bit that she had left of her tongue, we wanted to make it strong so that she could articulate the sounds as best she could. The sounds that she was struggling most with were those lateral sounds, so the, the sounds that we use the side of our tongue for, um, obviously because she didn't have one side of her tongue, she was really struggling with those, so they're sounds like and zzz. so we were asking her to do those kind of sounds seeing the quality of her sound so whether we could still um, interpret what she was saying so she was intelligible which was great that's kind of our main aim really so making sure that people are still intelligible and people can still understand them so for her it was just those exercises strengthening that tongue to make sure that she can articulate those sounds and um, eat and drink properly um so yeah that was my first day uh we wrote up some notes afterwards um which i'm still getting the hang of um we fed back to the nurse on the ward for that lady um and it was a lot of me just kind of um following my PE about but at the moment that's what I feel most comfortable doing because as you can tell it is quite a high risk area to be working in in speech therapy um, a lot of these patients are very emotional they have been through a lot and imagine getting your whole voice box removed <sighs> I, well it would be awful so yeah it's it's a lot of adapting to that kind of situation at the moment so yeah i'll keep you up to date on what i'm doing in placement so um i think this week i might be going into theater which will be amazing so i might get to actually see the laryngectomy being done um which i'd be so interested to see because obviously you hear about it and you read books but nothing's like actually seeing it happen. So that would be really cool. Um, I think we're doing lots of pre-treatment things with people who are just about to start radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So I can tell you a bit more about that when it happens. So yeah, if you like this video, remember to give it a thumbs up. Um, subscribe if you want to keep hearing about what I'm doing on placement. Um, I'm hoping you're finding it as interesting as I am. Okay, see you later.